You're listening to the GRCC Provost Podcast. Greetings, persons of quality. The GRCC community has been eagerly awaiting something. We're going to talk about that something today. We're going to talk about that person today. We've searched for several years for a new executive director of distance learning and instructional technologies, and we have found him. You've been here, Bill Knapp, about three and a half months. Right. I'm sure you have felt the community embrace you with eagerness and excitement about what can be with distance learning at GRCC. Well, yes, they actually, it was a little disconcerting. (laughs) Everyone's saying, you know, welcome. I I have been very welcomed, but I think um, everyone keeps saying we're so excited and it just worries me a little bit. I'm not sure what those exciting expectations are, but uh, but I am glad to be here, and yes, it has been very welcoming. I'm hoping, Noah, that you can get like a drum roll in there or something, some sort of exciting music or like the regal throne room music or something. Bill Knapp. Is here. Bill, tell us a little bit about your journey to get here, you have a you have an interesting, diverse background. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, that's true. Um, I actually had a whole career in human services before I began in higher education. I worked in community action agencies. I ran a shelter for homeless for a while, um, so that was quite a bit different. But one of the projects that I was working on back in uh, 1995 was a database to try to get all of the human services in the multiple counties into one database where people could share it. And what we found was we could get it all into the one, but not everyone could share it. So we were looking at that time at using the internet to share it. And so I contacted Ferris State University at the time, and they showed me how to get a hold of some free software. And we began talking about opportunities where I could learn, maybe to learn to use HTML and use it with uh, a program that could help us talk to the databases, Cold Fusion. And so that's kind of how I got started in using technology. Uh, I ended up getting hired part-time at Ferris State by the manager of instructional technology. And part of the deal was he was going to help me learn how to write HTML and and use this kind of technology. At that time, we didn't have learning management systems like Blackboard or uh, or even WebCT, which is what we ended up uh, adopting at Ferris. Um, so everything just went out on the web. And we had a web server, and every course was a little bit different, and there were some pretty uh, amazing things that people were trying to do. But we didn't really have a lot of the functionality that we have today. So that's, that was my beginning. Um, I did stay at Ferris. I actually went back to school. I had an associate's degree from North Central Michigan College. It was uh, majored in sociology, so with an associate's degree and a major in sociology, you really couldn't do a lot. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I did... no offense to the sociology <laughs> folks. I no, just want to... No, that's We don't true. want you in trouble here, that's Bill. That's true. Okay. Uh, but it was an interesting program, and, and I did go back to school. I got my bachelor's degree at Ferris while employed there. Uh, continued and got my master's in education and career and technical education. My focus area was professional development and training, so it fit well when I ended up getting hired by the Faculty Center for Teaching and Learning and working in instructional technology there. I was there until 2010, and at that point, I took a position as Dean of Learning Technologies at Lakeland Community College, which was just east of Cleveland. Was there for seven years, kind of homesick, heard about this position and thought, this would be great. I can come back to West Central Michigan and always kind of been my home. I knew about GRCC, worked with people from GRCC in the past, so I was pretty excited about the opportunity. And now I've been here a little, as you said, a little over three months, and it's Mm -hmm. been a good experience. Mm -hmm. You have kind of this interesting career path of that we talk to our students about all the time. You know, you may not end up doing what you plan to do. You may not end up 
specifically using the major you studied when you were in college. I think it's just a really interesting story to me, um, having had a career that was so much more traditional. I mean, I was going to go to school all my life. What do you think? Think back to North Central Michigan College in Petoskey, right? Right. What did you learn there in your when your time with sociology as your focus? And you had, of course, a lot of other courses. What do you think you learned there that, or did you learn anything there that allowed you to have the career you had, which was very not the path you might have expected when you started? I guess that's true. When I think back, um, I think what I took from the sociology courses at that time was I was very interested in the studies that were done uh, around people and how they interacted. And I was also very interested in opportunity, equal opportunity and access to opportunity. I think that's probably what the reason that I got into human services, hoping that I could maybe help people to um, to gain you know, maybe some independence or self-sufficiency. And I did that for a long time. But actually, it wasn't until I was employed at Lakeland that I began to see that community college is, is a true pathway for opportunity for people in the economically disadvantaged. And I see every, every year at commencement, seeing all of the students walk and realizing that they achieved a goal of theirs and that that achievement in and of itself is likely to lead to greater opportunity. So that's, I think that's the common thread throughout my entire career and continues to be something that kind of drives what I do. You, you held a number of positions at Lakeland. Yes. Um, so your higher ed career began in instructional technology, but you've had a broad range of experiences within higher ed. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. When I left Ferris State, I was the coordinator of instructional technology within the Faculty Center for Teaching and Learning. So our focus, of course, was faculty professional development, and my role was how to integrate technology into the teaching and learning process. How does it support teaching and learning? So when I took the position at Lakeland as Dean of Learning Technologies, I had a somewhat expanded role in that I was also responsible for their Center for Learning Innovation, which was the Center for for Professional Development. And then also had, uh, in addition to the distance learning strategic plan, I had technical customer services. What that is, uh, that was the um, classroom technology, the, the labs, the, the computing, and the projection, audiovisual, as well as the help desk. So that was broader for me and had some experience working in, with folks in each of those areas, but um, that was kind of new. But as time went on, uh, additional responsibilities uh, were assigned, and so I ended up... <laughs> I love that. I love how you use the passive voice. Additional responsibilities were assigned. Bill, that never happens here, so don't worry. Really. Yes. <laughs> so other responsibilities uh, ended up including mm-hmm. actually overseeing the library, which was a, a great experience for me. We did have a library director who is a faculty member and was on release to being in charge of the library, so I didn't have to learn a whole new skill set. Uh, <laughs> I just had to learn how to uh, interact and, and administer the library. I had some administrative experience, so that helped. And then ended up also taking on the Learning Center, which was our testing center, tutoring, student success and retention efforts. So that was it was significantly uh, broader, and I, when my my title when I left there was Chief Learning Resources Officer, and when I Googled it, I found I'm the only Chief Learning Resources Officer, so I did give that Ever? Up. Yeah, anywhere. Wow. So. I got to tell you, Bill, that's a way cooler title than you have here. <laughs> I'm just saying. Well, maybe, I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I have two plates on my door now, though. With that long title, so yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> two plate office. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you like to do for fun? Any hobbies you want to tell us about, or things you like to read, or I think um, abilities from, we're unaware of that uh, we might utilize. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if there's any abilities I have that anyone could utilize. <laughs> I. Uh, I do like to be outdoors. I like camping and hiking, and uh, I like using my mountain bike as much as I can. Uh, and in the wintertime, I like to actually cross-country ski and 
and uh, snowshoe. So um, actually coming back to Michigan is great. Uh, we have some kayaks. So that's how I like to spend my time when I have it. Beyond that, I don't know of any other particular skills. I, I enjoy Tai Chi and I like to read. Do you have one of those fat tire bikes that you ride in the winter? I don't, yeah. Um, but I've looked at those. I don't yeah. know. Maybe I'll, I'll look into that. Maybe. <laughs> I just, I see people on those, and I think two things. Wow, that must be really, really cold. And two, wow, I would fall. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I think. But they're, they're becoming so much more popular, and you see them so much more. Yeah. Um, so you have been here three and a half months and I've observed, and you've observed, that it seems like longer, and that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. Um, you and I actually worked together at Ferris a, a bit. So, what was that? Maybe twenty years ago. <laughs> it feels like it. Fifteen it or twenty. And isn't it amazing how we have not aged a yes, day? It is. I mean, it's it's really it's something about West Michigan that mm-hmm. is restorative. So you've been here three and a half months. Tell me a little bit about, and you know, I've talked about this, but tell the listeners a little bit about what you've observed about GRCC, where you think there's potential, where you think we're strong, culture, or right. it's, a, it's an open question. Okay. What do you think of, what do you, here it is, Bill, what do you think of GRCC so far? No pressure. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I think that <laughs> a lot of schools um, would be jealous of what GRCC has already done to kind of set a foundation. Um, GRCC probably uh, uh, doesn't have as many fully online uh, programs as many other schools, and certainly the schools that I've been uh, affiliated with. but. One of the things that they've done here, in addition to adopting their own standards for quality course design and delivery, they've integrated that into their training program for faculty that teach online. And with a lot of schools, um, they struggle with that, um, preparing faculty to teach online, because it is different, and there are some things that we need to know. Uh, the interactions that take place online, the structure of online design is important. And um, there's a great deal of evidence, uh, research that's been done in the area to know how to design a quality online course. So having those standards in place, integrating them into the training, um, and then the, uh, the work that's been done in preparing students as well is important with the online course orientation for new to online students. We were actually working on something similar at my previous institution and just piloting it. And in my discussion with others and in my role at other institutions, I find that they're all kind of uh, working on the same thing. So so we have a good foundation here. The kinds of things that need to be in place are here. I've met um, with different groups. There's a CAP project that's set up for helping students to be successful online. There's the, the Distance Learning Faculty Advisory Board. Uh, and several D-L faculty. D.L. Fab. D.L. Fab, right. Um, yeah. And they have all uh, seem very, I think, very uh, interested and engaged in the process. So knowing that uh, people are all working toward the same goals, that's really uh, another thing that is important to, in order for us to, uh, to move the needle. You've also created a, a group of faculty, brought together a group of faculty. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I invited faculty to, uh, actually I surveyed the faculty asking them about our services for the DLIT, Distance Learning and Instructional Technology Department. D-Lit. <laughs> yeah, we've got acronyms. Yeah. We, we're, we, I, I notice how the... They sound really cool here, yeah, don't they? Yeah, they do. I mean, and you always start with like one or two letters, and then you finish with uh, oh, with, with a, a vowel word. thrown yeah. in there, right? Yeah, yeah D-Lit. So, D-Lit. <laughs> so getting that information back is helpful for me so that I know what people uh, like or, or maybe room for improvement in those areas. But one of the things that I also asked them was, would they be interested in participating in a community of practice around teaching and learning online? And we had a pretty good response. Um, and I'm hoping that we're going to continue to get people interested in it. We have met once as a small group, and we scheduled our second meeting. But we're hoping also to use some uh, social media to keep in touch in between and to keep a dialogue 
around issues. But this group is going to focus on their own practice, bringing their own experience and wisdom to the table. Not unlike um, traditional face-to-face learning, I think a lot of times faculty feel isolated in their experience. They teach their course, they have their classroom, their students, and seldom do they really have an opportunity to get outside those walls. So the virtual classroom, I think we can offer some opportunities for people to come together and say, oh, I tried that and that didn't work for me, and someone else can pitch in and say, well, I also uh, did the same thing, but this is what I learned. So I, I'm hoping those would be the kinds of conversations that we stimulate. Mm-hmm. When when you were interviewing here, you asked, so you know what what is it? Uh, what is what is the vision for distance learning at GRCC? And I said it's a really it's a really general, broad, thirty thousand foot vision. And it really encompasses two things, um, improve the quality of our online courses, and that would we would know that by improving success rates and completion rates. So that would be number one, quality. Number two, growth, um, but not kind of, you know, madcap growth, but strategic growth, um, particularly around options in the Associate of Arts degree, more options for students. Um, with courses that result in an AA degree because we see a much larger proportion of part-time students now, almost 70% at GRCC. And then I I said to you, I don't have anything in mind. I don't want to scare anybody by naming names, but I wonder what we could do with some niche workforce occupational programs that might be offered in a hybrid fashion because that's, that's a little more difficult um, given the lab intensive and equipment intensive nature of those programs. And, and uh, I said, then we need, a, we need someone in your role, we need a director to help get more specific than that, because that's all I got, right? That's, that's all I got at the 30,000 foot level. Um, you've been here three and a half months. Here's the big question. Do you think we can get there? Oh, I think so, yes. I mentioned that the two groups that I've met with, the CAP and the DL Fab group, we've, we've been talking about technology that can maybe help us to expand the um, learning environment. It used to be, um, not so long ago, that the gold standard for online delivery was asynchronous learning. We would uh, try to work more and more because it's the most flexible for students if they don't have to actually come and meet somewhere at a particular time um, that's that's ideal for those students who are perhaps most challenged with that. Could be people that are employed uh, third shift or second shift or, or stay-at-home parents, uh, you know, situations that prevent them from being able to come to campus at a, at a regular schedule. So what we want to look at is how can we leverage things like um, web conferencing solutions, um, video, um, how do we maybe leverage uh, the different kinds of social media applications, not necessarily using Facebook, but they're the same kinds of technologies that allow people to interact just in time or in real time. And I think those are the types of tools that can help uh, ex- extend the classroom so we can move to a virtual environment but um, utilize those technologies that that allow us to interact in real time. And, and in some ways, virtual labs work the same way, where we can interact around uh, hands-on technologies. So I think there are opportunities, and we'll have to look at those. We were even talking about that with a cooking class at some point in the future. Could we not uh, record it or even have a live demonstration? Could the students do a live re- demonstration or recording of, of their cooking? So, mm-hmm. so there are um, different ways that we can can learn and, and, and utilize those technologies beyond asynchronous. So, Bill, um, you do have an office here. Tell everyone where it is so they can find you. It's on the third floor of Main uh, Building. I'm in room 344, and that's directly across from the Dean of Arts and Sciences office. Okay. And I've been, I've been bugging you about this. Is there any artwork in your office yet? 
Not yet. Okay. Yeah, I have actually a particular artist that I'm interested in getting oh, her okay. art. Um, and she is, uh, you know, Big Rapids has a co-op uh, art, I don't know, guild of sorts there. And I know she has had her stuff displayed there in the past. But when I was there, I couldn't find it. So, okay. But I understand they have uh, a holiday art display coming okay. up. So I'm hoping to pick some up. Okay. So you're really waiting for just the right I know what I'm after. Element. Okay. Right. All right. That shows <laughs> superior judgment. <laughs> So I, I also, I know this about you, and it had nothing to do, it had nothing to do. Actually, I didn't, I didn't know it, but I found it out in the hiring process when, when you were being interviewed. had nothing to do with your being hired. You are a cat person. I am a cat person. Cat person. Yes. Tell us about your cat. My cat's name is Harry. I've had several cats. They all tend to have human names. We had a Donald mm -hmm. most recently. Donald. We did have a Zipper, but I don't really know yeah. how Zipper got his name. He may have had it when he came. Okay. But anyway, uh, yeah, Harry, he's a, he's a good-sized cat. He's pretty happy. I know. I think when cats are happy, they tend to get bigger. So he's a large Like cat. humans. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Well, I don't. So I've, he's a, I've heard. Yeah. So he's, a, he's, a, he's a good guy. We've had him for about... Uh, I think 12 years now, or he's 12 years old. I think we've had him for 10 years. We actually adopted him from a lady who had a large collection of cats and dogs, hmm. and uh, apparently she needed to downsize, so we <sighs> said we would take Harry off her hands, and he's been a good fit. But you like dogs, too? I do, yeah. Okay. And Harry's a bit of a character. I mean, he he's, I don't know. He likes to pick fights with the dogs, and he likes to annoy you. I mean, he's, you know. He's a good cat. He's a good cat. He's a good cat. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that is a question that everyone on the podcast get at, gets asked. Oh, I see. Cat or dog person. Bill, any, anything I didn't ask you that you wish I had? Anything you need to get off your chest here today? I don't know. I think, you know, one of the things that people still talk about, even though online learning in the form that we deliver it these days has been around for several years now as that people are still concerned about whether online learning uh, is equivalent to face-to-face -to -face and so on. I guess the one thing I would say is that it can be and it should be. And um, in order to get there, you, you, you might have to sit down and, and talk with others about it, you know, and look at examples and bring resources to bear. Our instructional designer um, is someone that I think can really help, but I, I'm also willing to sit down and talk with faculty about their courses. If they think we really can't do this online, um, I still think maybe it's worth sitting down and discussing because it's there's a good chance that others have already done it and maybe they've faced some of the same challenges. So I just suggest that we're here, we're available, and love to chat about it. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much for being here mm -hmm. at GRCC. Yeah, thank Just keep, you. Keep coming back. I am. I do encourage everybody uh, to chat with Bill. Um, you're, you're just an interesting guy, and you know a lot about distance learning and instructional technology, and you know a lot about a lot of things. Um, so, uh, And he's just a really nice guy, too. Noah, isn't he? <laughs> very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Um, uh, one last question. We don't have to keep this on the podcast. What's your assessment of the technology skills of your, your colleagues, your administrative colleagues, like the other deans? and most? What do you think? I mean, compared to other places you've been, higher, lower, outstanding? I would say maybe they are on par <sighs> with others that I've worked with. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent answer. Okay. Thanks, Bill. To all of my listeners, please remember, you are the highly esteemed, much appreciated faculty, staff, and students of a very happy provost. And Bill, we end it with boom. You've been listening to the GRCC Provost Podcast, produced by GRCC Media Technologies. Join us next episode for more Provost.